Well, welcome uh, to uh, today's webinar on social innovation and responses to food insecurity um, with our keynote speaker today, Professor Alex Murdoch. Um, this is one of a number of um, webinars that we produce um, at the FS Club um, and a really interesting topic uh, given the current state of um, society and the economy. Um, you probably know me already, but I'm Mike Wardle, the Chief Executive and Head of Indices for the ZN Group. Um, my job today is to uh, chair the session, um, and I'll get out of your way very quickly so we can hear from Alex. Um, first of all, just a brief um, thanks to our sponsors. Um, the FS Club uh, runs this series of webinars with the generous support uh, of our sponsors, and we're really, really uh, grateful for them allowing us to range uh, quite far and wide across the fields of the economy, uh, science and technology and finance. Um, the format for today is the normal one that we, um, a very brief introduction, uh, about 20 minute presentation from Alex um, to get really deep into the subject of food insecurity and responses to it. Um, and there'll be time for questions and answers towards the end of the session. For those of you who haven't used um, the GoToWebinar system before, uh, the way to ask a question is to find the uh, question tab on your dashboard um, and type in your question. Um, you can do that at any point during the presentation and I'll field those questions uh, towards the end of the session. Uh, just to say that we'll pass on uh, your contact details, those of you who ask questions, just so that if there's further discussion and follow-up uh, needed, um, you can be in touch with Alex uh, after the event. Um, and so, without any further ado, uh, it just remains for me to um, hand over to Professor Alex Murdoch, Professor Emeritus at London South Bank University. Uh, Alex, the floor is yours, and we're really looking forward to hearing what you have to say to us this morning. Okay. Well, thank you very much, everybody. Um, and I thank also uh, Zen Yen for uh, in inviting me to give this, this talk. I'm conscious that it may appear initially that this is uh, perhaps not necessarily um, a talk that would focus on city-orientated people, but I hope that uh, the line that I'm taking, which is around looking at it in terms of innovation, may very well uh, generate some interest. Um, my own background is uh, set out on the um, uh, on the invitation, so I'm not going to go into that. Rather, I'm going to focus on the presentation itself. So if I can go to the next slide, please. Um, so this is a bit of just the outline here. I'm looking at the uh, nature of food su support, and I'm going to look at um, particularly the origins of food banks. And I'm going to give an acknowledgement to, to one of the un unacknowledged heroes of um, responses to food insecurity. I'm going to focus then pretty much on the notion of social entrepreneurship, collaboration, and um, partnerships. I regard food insecurity as one of the areas where the private, the public, and the nonprofit or charitable sector intersect in a way that is different from almost everything else because everybody, in effect, gives something and gets something. So, um, I'm going to look at these types of innovation and various models, and I'm going to walk you around the world. I think I still am possibly one of the only researchers who's physically walked the talk in food banks on four continents. In other words, I, my research involved actually going into the food banks themselves, spending time there, and in at least a couple of them actually participating in, in what's called working the line. And then there'll be a brief conclusion. Can I have the next slide, please? That's just really um, a slide there to you know, establish credentials. That's a journal issue that I edited um, looking at food, food banking and food insecurity. Next slide, please. So um, when it all started uh, in 2016, I, this guy with, with the phone to his ear is a guy called John Van Hengel, who, um, it, who I regard as the mother load in food banking in Phoenix, Arizona. And when I went there to do research in the first food, it's called the first food bank. And in fact, it is the first food bank, not just in America, but I, as far as I could see the first food bank anywhere. And Mr. Van Hengel, uh, who was a logistics manager, not a charity worker, was the person who set it up. Um, next slide, please. Um, so, uh, food and access to food is often seen as a third world issue, but it's particularly an area in developed countries. And in fact, um, food 
banking is a phenomenon that you find more in developed and high-income countries than in low-income countries, and that's an interesting dilemma that we'll touch on in a moment. Um, next slide, please. Okay, uh, at this point, um, you can see a, a cartoon there, and I'm going to um, ask um, Peter now to run a, a poll, which I think he's set up there. And I'm going to ask you to simply pick um, one of those answers, yes or no. Are food banks a reflection of societal failure? And you can either pick yes or no, and just react quickly, don't agonize over it. Okay, so go to it. So we've got single answer, 70% say yes it is, and I'm conscious this is a not what I would describe as the uh, normal um, audience that I would be presenting to, which would be, should we say, people from the charitable sector. Um, so I, I think that's an interesting one, that from a, well, from a Zen Yen audience, we're saying seven, two thirds, over two thirds regard them as a reflection of societal failure. Next slide, please. So here is what's lying behind it, and it's what I call the left and right critique of food banking. The left critique is what I would almost describe as the 70% of you. And you can see there, food banks are a way the state gets out of having responsibility. They're stigmatizing. There's a risk of them becoming institutionalized. It's driven by welfare cuts and sanctions, and they represent a provision that really shouldn't be there at all. Whereas the right critique um, is that food banks are societal response, they enable redistribution of food surpluses, they're efficient and attractive to donors and volunteers, they're first certainly a better allocation than if uh, those of us who can remember the EU food mountains, and their um, demand is supply driven. In fact, food banks distribute food which is not paid for, and so naturally people um, would take something which is a free gift. So um, next slide, please. So briefly, and I'm not going to go in there, these are the dilemmas of food banking, um, and uh, there are about five dilemmas, which um, um, was, I say, I would think this is probably my contribution to food banking, is this dilemmas of food banking. Do you feed the line or shorten the line? Do you waste not and refuse nothing, or do you only accept healthy food? Do you work with the government or do you challenge government? Are you cautious about the liability for food donated or do you regard formal food practice as simple advisory? Do you engage in high trust um, with partners or do you focus on um, faith-based and strong governance? So those are the dilemmas in food banking. Can we move on please, next slide. So looking at variations in innovation, um, We've got this concept that food is basic, uh, but is there an aspect of choice? And welfare payments and income do not enable choice if they're insufficient to meet basic need. And so the discourse is often around individual failure, the so-called claimant image, but also the discourse is around state failure in food insecurity. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> so um, if we look at this question about uh, how you might involve um, what I would describe as social businesses in the food area. And here we've got this concept of collaboration between nonprofits and the states. And LaRue and Gerdel uh, suggested those four areas of um, collaboration, um, which is piloting new programs, collaborating to reduce costs, requiring collaboration uh, in order to benefit, you know, for the organization to benefit, and other types. Um, this is a useful typology, but it doesn't really um, include the private sector, and it doesn't consider collaboration, for instance, between individuals such as volunteers and beneficiaries. So this is a, a useful starting point, but I don't think it um, is, is really thorough enough. Can we move on, move on please? Um, this, I think, sums up a lot of the attitude to food banking, and my guess is that if there's 30 people in this audience, at least five or six people have probably uh, helped a food bank, which is a high proportion. In other words, you've donated food, you may even have 
engaged in, in more active uh, activities with food. It's a very high uh, engagement. And in fact, when I looked at the states, there hasn't been any data done, but when I went around the states, I found that um, in fact, uh, um, it was one of the highest engagement sectors uh, in, that are other than churches. Please move on, thanks. So um, let's look at innovation. And this is where I'm going to try and walk through a lot of examples here. And I've um, set up, used Schumpeter really as a basis here. And, and those of you who are familiar with um, Schumpeter's notion of innovation, and you can have innovation in product, the introduced introduction of a new good, process, the introduction of a new method of production, business model, source of supply, and there's the issues about mergers and divestment. So uh, I, I use Schumpeter as, as a simple basis. Can we move on, please? So um, the other area is that um, with a Professor Alex Nichols of Oxford University, I wrote what is probably the um, one of the standard books on social innovation. And we came up with this concept of innovation in three uh, areas, which is incremental, which is you know, where you just um, move things along um, incrementally, um, where you have institutional innovation, where you try and change market structures to create new value, and disruptive, where you engage in disruptive innovation. And we've seen that perhaps you know, with Greenpeace and, um, and microfinance and so on. So we've used this model as well in, in the rest of this presentation. Can I move on? And so the framework we've looked at there is, um, we've looked at innovation against collaboration. So the concept of collaboration in one axis and the concept of innovation in the other. And this provides a two dimensional space in which to consider uh, responses to food insecurity. And now I think we're pretty soon going to get into actually looking at examples. So next slide, please. So let's first of all look at incremental innovation through collaboration. So um, the incremental innovation is the soup kitchen. And I set a little challenge to my colleagues, which Mike passed. Um, Chicago in the 19, late 1920s, whose soup kitchen is it? And um, it's that well-known um, philanthropist Al Capone. And Al Capone, in fact, set up um, food distribution systems uh, during the, um, the Great Recession in the late 20s. And it's one of the reasons why he was pretty impregnable in Chicago politically, because he actually had a welfare state. And that soup kitchen is, in fact, Al Capone's soup kitchen. But you can innovate um, by bringing soup to the people rather than bringing the people to the soup. And as you can see on the right is the is a soup run. Uh, I think that might be a Salvation Army one, but I'm not sure. Um, and it's uh, bringing soup to where people are. So that's a, an innovation and it's a collaborative one. Next, please. Moving on to the soup kitchen model, it's been around a long time and it's what often is described as Victorian type philanthropy. Um, anyone who can remember Oliver Twist, um, and please, uh, can I have some more where he's queuing up for soup. Um, on the right hand side, you've got a, um, a soup kitchen in New York and the guy in the shirt there is the manager of it. And Toyota uh, said, can we help? And he said, well, you know, you can't cook. You're an engineering company. You make cars. What's that got to do with soup kitchen? They said, what's the problem? He said, I've got two long queues for my soup kitchen. And two uh, Toyota engineers basically said, oh, that's easy enough. That's a production process problem. We can sort it out. And they did. So they sorted out the um, long queues for his soup kitchen. He was quite impressed. Next slide, please. Um, then you can get uh, innovation through what's called collaboration of new products and services. And on the left hand side, you can see a normal food parcel. If you can see there, there's a Frey Bentos tin, there's Quaker oats, there's rice, there's tins of various stuff. But what about somebody who's got no means to cook it? What do they do with it? And so one of the things impressive about the Trussell Trust was they realized that there were people who literally didn't have the, you know, a cooker. And so they um, provided food packs that were specifically designed for that. And they had what are called kettle packs, where somebody 
for instance, was in um, a temporary accommodation, but they had access to a kettle, and so they could boil water. And so that was a bottom-up innovation of the Trussell Trust, where they realized that some of the food parcels they were giving out weren't much use because people didn't have means to cook the contents. Um, can we move on, please? Next slide. Um, one of the interesting areas of, of collaboration is the idea of volunteering. And these are both from the United States food banks, which I visited, and you can see a difference. They're both volunteers. On the left-hand side, you can see a lady with her daughter, I assume, and volunteers helping out in a food bank. On the right, you see a slightly different one. That is, they're all wearing the same T-shirts. Those are not food bank T-shirts. Those are corporate T-shirts. And in fact, quite a lot of American corporates do their um, team building exercises and they go to food banks for them. And so um, that I think is a really interesting innovation. In fact, when I was going around the food banks, I asked the food banks how much they charged the corporates to volunteer. And they looked at me blankly and I said, they're gonna do these team building exercises anyway. And they're gonna have to go somewhere and they're probably gonna have to pay um, coaches to do it and you're doing it all for them and they said yes but they're helping out in the food bank and I said yes but um, you know you you know in effect they're getting a free good from you which is the team building exercise why don't you charge them for it I'm not sure what happens as a result of that advice but uh, I have a feeling that the corporates would have been quite willing to pay um, next slide please what about as a requirement of collaboration? And here I think the United States has evolved possibly the most complex arrangement. And they've got something called SNAP, also known as food stamps, which has a fairly complex regulatory setting. Um, the US Department of Agriculture sets expiry dates on food. And um, you know, how long after, for instance, can you use biscuits after the expiry date? And so um, you get a lot of collaboration in, in food banking. Can we have the next slide, please? And food banks interact, interact with a range of partners and it creates a cons, com, com, complex landscape. In some cases, it raises concerns. And I found in some food banks, they were using uh, inmate volunteers from the local prisons in food banks. And my colleague who was with me, um, American colleague, said, oh, he said they're probably low low risk prisoners and I said oh no they're not they've got a prison guard sitting on a chair in the corner these are not low risk prisoners so it was a, and those were some of the most effective volunteers in that food bank because they were long term and they knew how to do the job so uh, interesting development there but you might have views about use of use of prison labor in food banks next stage next slide please um this is a, a in Bangalore, it's in a scientific laboratory called Griffith Laboratories, and they worked with the Bangalore Food Bank in India to develop a new food product called Kichdi. And uh, it's an, essentially, they developed a new food product, particularly for the food bank, which was uh, um, a more effective way of um, dealing with hunger than the normal food products. Next slide, please. Um, then we've got um, inter institutional innovation and reducing cost. Um, I'm conscious of time, Mike, so I'm, I'm aware of it. Um, so um, how do they measure food donation? Um, and one of the things that really intrigued me was in America, and in fact, almost everywhere, including the UK, um, food measure is often simply by the weight. You know, we've distributed 16 tons of food, we've delivered 12,000 meals or whatever. It doesn't say what was in there. What would happen in your supermarket if you pushed your trolley onto a scale and they charged you one pound per kilo for your shop? Well, um, that actually happens where the Trussell Trust is concerned with one of the supermarkets where the uh, Trussell Trust pointed out that the supermarket, people bought stuff in the supermarket and then dumped it in the Trussell Trust box on the other side of the till. And the supermarket was in fact taking a profit from the food that had been bought for the food bank. And so the, the, the uh, supermarket in question agreed with the Trussell Trust that the Trussell Trust would simply weigh the food and the supermarket, I think Tesco, would actually pay money based on the weight of food donated. 
So it's an interesting, uh, simple measure um, about um, reducing cost in terms of assessing exactly what was there. You just weigh it. Next, uh, um, in the United States, some food banks have acquired delegated powers to assess people for entitlements. And it has a risk there because that's where food banks can become an arm of the state. So um, the Trussell Trust in the UK um, is, is quite apprehensive about that, you know, getting involved as the arm of the state. But it, it's a form of collaboration where they, it, sometimes it, it's a win-win situation. Next slide, please. Um, and then we get to the last bit. And here, um, you know, within probably a hundred yards of all of you is something like Incredible Edible. Uh, there's, I live in Lambeth and uh, there's one about um, 50 yards behind my house where they're growing food in, um, uh, you know, on the fringes of a, of a car park. Um, it's basically food grown uh, in wherever um, you can find space. Incredible Edible started in Todd Morden and now it has spread. It's a global movement um, in, in USA, Canada, Australia and France. And it seems to mirror the countries where food banking took off. Next slide, please. Um, and then we get the German Tafel, which um, I think is one of the most sophisticated food bank operations in Europe. And um, it's supposed to be pretty standardized, but if you look at the next slide, you can see when I went round Germany, I found there were four variations of the Tafel. Uh, the Berlin model was basically fresh produce being distributed. The Bernau model um, was, a, you know, old East Germany and it provided food parcels, but virtually obliged a financial contribution. The Magdeburg one was set up as an employment initiative following reunification of Germany and loss of jobs. And then we got the Stuttgart model, which is effectively a social supermarket where people go in and buy discounted food and the volunteers and staff who run it also can get discounted food. If I can move on to the next one, I'm conscious of time. Um, the most integrated food bank I've seen is probably St. James Settlement in Hong Kong, where they've dealt with stigmatization, where they have everything under one roof from kindergarten, funeral services, library, and a food bank, the whole lot is under one roof. And it's really reduced the stigma of using a food bank. Um, next slide, please. Um, new products and services where you're probably familiar with vertical farming. Um, I've been around the nearest vertical farm to where I'm sitting now. It's only two miles away. It's under the railway tunnels on the Northern line in Clapham. And that, in fact, on the lower of those pictures is a picture of that, um, of, of that vertical farm. Um, under, underneath there. So new services, new technology, uh, we don't need necessarily arable land to grow food on. Um, next please. And fair share in the UK um, integrated into the actual factories as opposed to, to try and get um, food donated from further back up the supply chain. And that I thought was a pretty um, creative way. They reduced the cost of, of uh, donating food by going back further up the supply chain to get it. Um, next slide, please. And then you've got, um, moving towards the end, we've got the real junk food movement. Um, a, an interesting guy, name guy, it actually was named Adam Smith, who set up the real junk food project um, and took food that was about to be dumped and uh, used it in, in um, pay, pay as you feel cafes and so on. Next slide. And that uh, reflected in Copenhagen with a, an outfit called Rubenstuhl, which uh, is an interesting um, non-profit restaurant which uses um, food waste to, um, for, for its, its menus. And finally, I think, next slide, I think we're on the last one. Oh, that's um, collaboration by um, Association of Mexican Chefs where they um, gather food. Next slide, please. And it provides benefits to vulnerable people and rescues food and uh, certifies the food and distributes it to charities. And it's essentially restaurant chefs that are, have, have organized it. And I think I'm getting the next one here. And this one uh, is a guy called Shoaz. And I, he's a fascinating guy. And I met him at the Global Food Bank Conference a couple of years ago. 
and um, he has possibly one of the most comprehensive networks um, I've seen in Egypt. And this one I thought was really ingenious. How did he get people to leave more food on the, um, you know, the uh, sort of the central table of the Hilton Hotel rather than taking it onto their plates and then and then uh, he'd simply said reduce the plate size. And so it left more on the buffet for him to distribute. And when you next go to any buffet, look at the plate size and see whether this is, this innovation is spread. Reduce the plate size, reduce food waste. Um, and I think can I I think I'm now onto my summary slides. So initially I just looked at the growth of food banks, but it's wider phenomena. Food insecurity reaches beyond food banks. It involves a range of entrepreneurial activities. The concepts of collaboration and innovation are central. And particularly, I think, is interesting the experience of other countries. And final slide, which is the next one. Comments, questions, and answers. So thank you so much, everybody. And I think I'm a little bit over time, but hopefully not too much. Um, well, Alex, about, about a minute over time, which is really, <laughs> really excellent. Thank you very much um, for that sort of tour de table, if I may, um, of, uh, of of food bank history and and development, and particularly the innovative approaches that people have taken. Um, I've got a number of questions uh, from the audience. Um, one from Robert McDowell, he's asked, what have been the outcomes of state subsidy of certain foods? And he knows the example of France where they sort of subsidise mm -hmm. the get. Are there other examples of you know, subsidise uh, certain types of food or food groups um, to assist in uh, food poverty? Okay, I think it, it depends a lot on where the level of food you know, production is. So for instance, America, um, you know, if you're looking at international development, um, America, for example, overproduces wheat and you get wheat um, shipped to countries where wheat is not really part of the diet. So it's not usually very helpful. Um, you know, but um, what, what I found in the States was, was walking around with a, a colleague, an American friend of mine who wasn't into food banking, but he was um, a pretty sharp guy. And we were walking around the food bank distribution centers and he was pointing at various um, tinned products and he said, you can't buy those. He said, they don't exist in the supermarkets. But, um, and so we were trying to figure out what they were. And some of them actually had been produced for the food bank. But instead of calling it, um, you know, food bank food, they had invented a brand and put it on the tin to, uh, you know, so that it didn't look so, look stigmatizing. And some of it was, I think, uh, institutional food that had been donated. And again, it had a brand on it that had been distributed perhaps to hospitals or whatever, but the food had been distributed. So um, I think there's an element there of, um, of the biggest subsidy program, of course, is food stamps, SNAP in the States. And that um, is restricted in the sense that you can't use the money to buy alcohol, you can't buy cigarettes. It's uh, limited to certain foods. So um, those sorts of subsidy programs are there. And also you're getting a, an increasing phenomena of um, what's called social supermarkets, where people ba basically go, there are about um, four, I think, in London now. And they started in, um, in, Dub in Yorkshire, I believe. And those social supermarkets say, well, if you've got a, a benefit card, uh, you know, you, you're receiving a benefit. You can go along to a social supermarket and you can buy uh, what is there. And that, I think, I love, I love social supermarkets because they actually offer choice. People buy what they want and they, and I think it's not unreasonable for people to be asked to contribute towards the cost of food. I have a worry that if you donated food, you know, donated food is food that doesn't necessarily have a value. And as a business uh, lecturer, business professor, I think that um, a free good, you know, how do you know it's, it's valuable? How do you know it's value? I, I think it's not unreasonable for, for people to put um, some money towards food they receive, but maybe discounted. I don't know if that answers the question. 
Thank you very much. Um, the next question from Clive Bullen, who says food banks are undoubtedly a, a great response to a need. However, isn't there a failure, um, a societal failure, I guess, in educating and supporting people to have the education skills to mean they don't have to rely on food banks and then their children don't have to rely on food banks? You know, so yeah. how, does, how does this fit, fit into um, societal well, development? Well, I, I think if he had asked that question maybe four years ago, it would have had a lot of valence. But now, for example, the NHS is running, in effect, food banks for their staff. Um, so you're getting organizations um, that have taken on food banking as a way to support their lower paid staff. And it's um, for those of people who, uh, who uh, have a memory of what the foundations of something called the Truck Act, you know, I'll have no truck with that. That was when, in effect, people were being paid in food or something like that, not money. And so the, the Truck Act was to say you, you can only pay people a salary. You can't sort of give them food instead. But um, I'm wondering whether some of these um, food banks linked to employers are coming close to violating the Truck Act. They're saying, in effect, you, you, um, if you're short of food, we've got uh, a corporate facility here where you can pick up some, uh, some food. And, and some people might say, well, why don't you just pay them more? Um, so um, I the question was around, well, um, is it around individual failure where people, for example, um, uh, no longer, you know, it's, it's the thing where, um, you know, some people, bloggers say, well, if people could learn to cook um, and manage food better, then they wouldn't, they'd, they'd be able to manage on what they have rather than saying they need more money. Um, and that's an interesting discussion. Um, there are people of us uh, on this um, on this uh, webinar who may be of an age where they could remember uh, there was something called domestic science taught at school and pretty much everyone had to take it. Um, but now uh, it's an interesting phenomenon that people come out of school and I see students who have got a total inability to cook anything, uh, mm. can't even boil an egg. And these are not what I would describe as uh, struggling people these are well educated people but they've literally never acquired cooking skills because it's not been part of their upbringing and so there's an interesting discussion there about whether uh, food should be uh, something that people is part of people's um, education in the same way for instance as an e exercise and ethics and so on so that may answer both sides of that question Yes, I think I think Clive is also talking about the general upskilling of the population so that they can get better jobs, which are better paid, which are therefore well, avoid need. Yeah. I mean, um, that, 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 that's true as well. But if you look at the proportion that people spend on food, um, and if you go back over time, people used to spend an awful lot more of their income on food proportionally than they do now. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it went down, I think, to about 11% of uh, my correct me if I'm wrong, but people used to spend, just spend about 11%. And food prices have gone up now. And that, and food, you could argue, is a given good. In other words, um, if you, you have to have it, and if it goes up in price, then you, you in effect save on something else in order to get enough food. And so that's a fair point, you know, that if food prices go up, then that should be reflected in, in income, especially for lower paid people. Yeah, and, and Trevor, Trevor Hill has asked me the direct question, is the phenomen, phenomenon of full, people in full-time work using food banks an indication that either the state or the charitable sector is actually subsidising companies that pay less than the real living wage? Um, yes, indeed. And, and when we can think of another number of other examples where there, there are benign subsidies to low wages um, through the tax system. Uh, tax credits, for instance, you could say are a subsidy for low wage. Um, and I think those are very fair points. Um, I've lived in a, an expensive food country with high tax. I lived in Copenhagen for a while when I was a professor at the university there. And it was noticeable that the food costs in Copenhagen were higher. And so was the tax rate. And so, and in fact, one of the um, scandals, and you know, I didn't use the picture, but it's, a sc it's um, behind a supermarket in uh, Copenhagen um, 
where um, people have been getting food out of the dumpster behind the supermarket. And the staff in the supermarket were fed up with people dumpster diving. So they stuck a sign on the supermarket, on this dumpster, saying in Danish, we hope you enjoy the food, we've urinated on it. And, um, and, and that was a, a sort of a, a measure that in, in Denmark, there was a feeling that, no, you know, people shouldn't have to go into dumpsters for food, you know. But on the other hand, food in Denmark is expensive. But, it, but on the other hand, people's uh, incomes match that. So very few people in Denmark are actually unable to afford, afford food. Um, you know, and, yeah. And Hugh Persis asked a question on the subject of shelf life, you know, best before dates and use by. And what are the best options for food bank, op for bank operations? You know, is it only to focus on <laughs> use by? Is it well, making the use by date a little bit longer, extending it? Well, um, well there's, that, that's a really interesting example. Um, when you look at anything in your cupboard, uh, you will see that it almost invariably has a date stamp on it. Even bottled water in the food banks, the bottled water had, a, I think it was a six month use by date, right? Um, and so there's the issue of use by and best by. So I've got some really nice Adnams beer, which is out of date, but it's not out of its drink by date, it's out of its best by date. And best by is, is what it says, it's best by. Use by actually says that under food regulations and the USDA regulations are probably the strictest. So for example, in you know when I was working the line in the Houston Food Bank, um, their um, biscuits, you know, what you call, we, the Americans call cookies, but biscuits were coming through. And if they were one minute out of date, they went in the bin. So if, they, if it was the 15th of February today, and the, uh, we, there were cookies in front of me that said, used by the 14th of February, they went in the bin. And all of the people on the food bank line were, you know, visitors and professionals, and we couldn't understand why it was so tight on, on mm. that. And there was two reasons, one good, one bad. The good reason was that, well, they had vegetable animal fats in them. And so, you know, it was like the equivalent of, of out of date meat. The second was cookies are nice and the poor shouldn't have them. Uh, so, so um, that the sometimes you know food banks uh, are able to extend dates so for example um in america if they were given uh, frozen food that was at, at just before its use by date and they refree froze it then they could extend the use by date as a food bank by about three weeks so uh, 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 tesco or sainsbury's couldn't do that but the food bank could and it's not an unreasonable strategy. You know, you've, you've probably got stuff in your freezer when you look at the date when you bought it and you think, oh, you know, but if you froze it before it's used by date, then it probably extends its life. But commercial outfits uh, like supermarkets can't do that. Um, so, so it, you know, I think use, use by dates are really interesting. And, um, and as I say, I think Al Capone was the person who created those because of his donation to Chicago um, um, Council of, uh, of, uh, of, I think it was about a million dollars for school milk. And uh, he was very concerned that they would just, you know, be corrupt and give the schools milk that was out of date and, or was sour. And so he insisted that all the milk supported by his donation had to be date stamped. And I tried to track back an earlier in use, use of, of food dating and I couldn't find it. And so I think Al Capone possibly as the person who started food dating. Well, <clears throat> um, for, for, for all he might have done wrong, um, that might have been a benefit, <laughs> benefit he's, uh, he's delivered uh, to us. Um, Robert McDowell's got a, a follow-up question about whether historically food banks have been transitory in line with economic prosperity. In other words, do they fade away in times of prosperity and come back? Or are they a permanent feature of developed society? Uh, I think they're a permanent feature. Um, when the Trussell Trust started around 2004 with two food banks in Salisbury, it's now got around about 11 or 1200. The Independent Federation of Food Banks have got about 1300 food, bank, food banks. And um, the, the answer to the question, are food banks like the poor always with us? 
Well, the European Federation of Food Banks has four reasons for why food banking is a good idea. Um, they've actually taken it off their website now because I think it, uh, it, it, it caused some comment. But one was to relieve food hunger. Yeah? The other three reasons are not to do with relief of hunger at all. Um, one of them is an obvious one, is to deal with food waste. Another one is to engage civil society, and food banks are an incredibly powerful engager of civil society. And the um, fourth is to inform public policy. So food banking, I think, um, is not going to go away. My inclination is that food banking, by and large, has got justification, even if there aren't an awful lot of hungry people around. Okay. Um, and a final question before we wrap up from Trevor Hilda. Um, so, sorry, from Hugh Purser again. Um, just asking whether if technology continues to improve food production and reduce waste, um, right. will, will food banks actually lose their main source of supply? Is there a oh, risk? That, that is a very sharp question. And, um, and one of the things I found when I was looking at food banking was the big issue of what I would call just in time. And if, for example, you go into anything like an, um, a modern, you know, recent supermarket like Aldi or Lidl, you will notice that the um, uh, storage space behind is, is often quite limited. And it's because as you buy stuff, so more stuff is supplied. So the, um, you know, there isn't so much, um, in effect, surplus to be disposed of. And so I think it's an excellent question. And in fact, it did cause uh, some concerns for um, food banks that uh, the uh, commercial side was getting too efficient and so there weren't the surpluses there. But there are the surpluses from another reason and that is that, Mike, when you go home tonight and your wife says to you, pick up some, uh, some fresh produce at the local supermarket and you walk into that supermarket at about seven or eight o'clock in the evening, you don't expect to see empty, veg empty produce shelves. And so the supermarkets in effect have to stock um, for the eventuality that a customer says, well, where's this or where's that? So even with efficient provision, there's still surpluses simply based on the fact that the regular customer in a supermarket wants to be able to go in there at 10 or 11 o'clock at night and find what they want. And so inevitably stuff does go out of date and you will see particularly in the cold shelves of supermarkets. Now, even the local Tesco's, you'll see stuff piled in there that's near its use by date. And, uh, you know, and it's what I call student food. You know, the student, you know, when I, all the students go for it. But, um, but the, inevitably there is still um, uh, surpluses, but they're not there. And I can tell you the stuff that food banks actually have to end up buying because it's not donated. And that's typically coffee. Mm -hmm. So if food banks often end up buying coffee to give to give out the parcel because it's rarely donated. Well, thank you ever so much, um, Alex. It's been a fascinating run through um, the world um, of you know importance in terms of um, social and economic um, life, um, but also um, you know importance in terms of innovation and the way in which we respond. Um, right. Thank you. Just, just a, a, a few last words from me. Uh, first of all, to, again, to thank our sponsors for uh, enabling us to run this series of webinars. Uh, we really are most grateful for your support. Um, and then just looking ahead um, to um, future events. Um, Wednesday this week, we have um, a session on mistakes in technology commercialization. So if you want to know how not to do it or how to learn from mistakes, um, come along to that one. Um, next week, the future cybersecurity landscape, employee share plans and benefits SMEs um, and a session on insurance and reinsurers about catastrophes and whether they're becoming uh, too big to insure. So um, lots of rich meat um, for you, um, perhaps richer than you might find in your local food bank. Um, it just remains for me to uh, thank you, the audience, for your attention today. The session ha has been recorded and so if you think you have colleagues um, who will be interested, the recording will be up in the next 24, 48 hours. Um, to thank particularly though Professor uh, Alex Murdoch uh, for his fascinating presentation today. Um, normally at a conference I would throw the floor open for a round of applause. Uh, we can't do that over this technology. So you'll have to make sure with a very little round of applause from me. Um, but it's been a pleasure and thank you so much for your contribution uh, today. Thank you.